my name is Kathy, and I'm one of the academic advisors in the Faculty of Science. And I want to welcome you all to the first in our Discover Your Future Through Science um, event, a series of workshops um, and information sessions to familiarize science students with the programs that are available to them beyond either a general science degree or one of the four-year major or honors programs in the Faculty of Science. I'm not going to say anything that might uh, overlap with what Julie is going to say to you, other than to just say, as an advisor in science, I want to welcome you all. If you have questions about how to complete your science degree and make sure that you're fulfilling entrance requirements to different professional programs, then please don't hesitate to come and see one of the advisors in the General Science Office, which is pretty nice and great hall. Um, I will also stick around to answer questions after the session, along with uh, Leslie, who also works in the, the science office, and over here, uh, Joey Dewberry, who is the lead admissions officer for the College of Medicine. And uh, so, having said that, I would like to introduce to you all Julia Blonsky, who is the administrator of missions in the Max Rady College of Medicine in the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences, and she is an alumnus of the University of Manitoba. Uh, with a Bachelor of Arts, and many years, 18 years of experience, student advising and program admission, uh, pro pro program administration, pardon me, and admissions. And Julia is uh, a passionate advocate of students and dedicated to ensuring they have access to all the information that they need. So please welcome Julia. Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you, Kathy, for lying so well. <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here and to talk to you about the Max Rady College of Medicine. Uh, I have my colleague with me, Stephanie Morin, who's the assistant uh, to, for admissions. And you've already been introduced to Jody, who knows everything. Um, I'm going to be going through a little bit about uh, Max Rady College of Medicine and the program. I'll talk a bit about admissions as well. Um, and I will be showing you some links to various web pages. Please don't write those down. They're on sheets at the front, which I see some of you have. So just sit back and relax, and uh, we'll just go through, and we'll be happy to answer questions at the end. So first I have to figure out how to use this. So why medicine? There are a lot of reasons why you might choose to go into medicine, and I'm just going to go through a few of them here, see if any of them fit with how you're feeling. Um, some of them are good reasons. Some of them are not so good reasons. I'm not going to say either way. I'll leave that up to you, but I think, I think they're definitely wor worth uh, talking about. So working with people. So to improve the lives and health of other human beings, that's always a, a wonderful goal to have. Most doctors would say that there's nothing better than saving the life of, uh, of someone or helping someone who's very sick get well or ha helping a family cope with end of life. So a sense of leadership and teamwork. So. I mean, doctors collaborate with all sorts of healthcare professionals on a daily basis, but they're also mentors and role models for their students and uh, for residents. Security. There's a great need for doctors, and especially as healthcare needs rise, and I probably don't have to say any more about that. I think we're all in agreement there. Many opportunities besides patient care. So just because you're a doctor doesn't mean that you necessarily have to be in a hospital. You could be in a, in a private clinic. But you could also be a clinical educator or a researcher or work for the government or work at a pharmaceutical industry or in the industry. So there's all sorts of opportunities there for you. So moving right along, how about lifelong learner? Physicians are definitely lifelong learners. Uh, medicine changes all the time, so physicians have to know all the new and improved things so they can bring that to their patient care. How about money? So if you want to make money, you can, yeah, I see some of you nodding on that, absolutely. 
Um, you can do many things, though. You could be a banker, you could be a lawyer, a stockbroker, I don't know, all sorts of things. But medicine is something you're going to do day in and day out. You're going to breathe and live this. And so if you don't love what you're doing, you're going to be miserable, and it's not going to matter how much money you make. And I, I, I think that's really important. As you start on this journey or you contemplate and think about starting this journey, that, that you really stop and, and think about your reasons for doing it. The other thing, too, of course, is that medical school is expensive, so you may have to be dealing with loans when you come out, and I, I don't know how rich you'll be in the beginning with that. Status and respect in society. So doctors are seen as a symbol of dignity and responsibility and service to the community. But respect and prestige is something that you earn because of the hard work that you do, not because you have an MD at the end of your name. And again, if that's the only reason you're going in, you, over your lifetime, will not be very happy with the choices that you've made. How about this one, pressure from parents? So I would say try and shadow uh, a doctor somewhere and see if it's something that you want to do in your life. You really have to have a passion for this profession, and you really can't be doing it for someone else. It just won't work for you, and that's all I'm going to say on that. So I did come with some advice uh, from, from some of our medical students. I thought about bringing one with me tonight, but they all went, we have an exam tomorrow, Julia. Are you crazy? So I just kind of left it. So make sure you know what you're getting into. So we talked a little bit about that already. Because um, you want to be happy on the other side. Work-life balance is important, so find the balance. You're not going to be the smartest person in the room. Yeah, I know that's hard for you all to hear. You've probably gone to university, and you may even feel that you're the smartest person that you know. But when you get into medicine, everybody is, is smart, and everybody knows a lot, and there'll always be somebody who knows more than you. And I've heard from the med students that, in the beginning, that's, that's really hard to take. Um, but eventually, you learn to appreciate that and realize that you feed off each other and you can learn from each other. You're never going to know everything, and that's just the way it is. Uh, you can't all be like me. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> um, but I mean, like I just said before, the medical profession changes all the time. So it's always renewing, and, and you're always going to be a, a lifelong learner. And that's OK. That really is OK. It's always going to be difficult when a patient dies. You're never going to get used to that. And it will change you. And I have heard from the medical students, it'll change you in some good ways, and maybe in some not so good ways. So just things to think about as uh, you're thinking about starting this journey. So, what is a doctor after we've gone through all of that? Take a moment to think about what you think a doctor is, and you may have more than the ideas that I have listed on the left here. Um, this is just to get your conversation going. The picture on the right is the CANMEDS Physician Competency Framework. And it identifies and describes the abilities physicians require to effectively meet health care needs of the people they serve. And so it talks about medical expert, communicator, collaborator, manager, health advocate, scholar, and professional. And a competent physician will integrate all of those things together in, in their practice. There's more information about this on the CAMMEDS website. We'll be talking a little bit more about CAMWeb. Wow, CAMMEDS in CAMMEDS in a few minutes. So the commitment. How long does it take? Well, and you may not be able to see this very well. I'm not sure. But your undergraduate degree is going to be three or four years. 
then you'll apply to medicine. And if you get in, the MD program is four years. And then after that, you need to do residency. And res residency is two to five years, depending on the uh, field that you, that you go into. And I have some more information on that. Come on in, uh, in a few minutes. So Manitoba's medical school. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Max Rady College of Medicine, the mission, the values, the curriculum, just so you have a snapshot of what it's all about. So the mission, to develop, deliver, and evaluate a high-quality educational program for the MD program. Nothing more to say there. That's the mission. And the values... So the values of the college are founded on the CanMed's competency framework, which I just mentioned, and the three pillars of discovery, scholarship, and community. And I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk about the three pillars and to have a drink of water. So we'll start with discovery. We'll unlock the water bottle. discovery. Our graduates will approach their profession with a spirit of discovery by welcoming, welcoming and adapting to change. So we've talked about the ever-changing need of medicine. Appreciating the continuum of basic science and human wellness. Building a broad and unbiased foundation of medical knowledge. And maintaining openness to practice in urban hubs, and in rural and northern communities. And that's in Canada and around the world. And so now let's talk about scholarships, or scholarship, not scholarships, not money, scholarship. Our graduates will embrace scholarship by pursuing academic excellence at every stage of their careers as clinicians, researchers, academics, administrators, whatever it is you decide to do. Medical research and innovation, so appropriate, appropriately applying medical research and innovation to patient care. Committing to lifelong learning, we've talked about that already. Lifelong maintenance of evidence-based practice and healing through knowledge and compassion, and acting as educators for patients, allied health professionals, and one another. So community. Our graduates will lead and collaborate with their community by advocating for health and safety. Communication, so that's with all healthcare professionals and uh, those in related sectors. <coughs> Exemplifying professionalism and respect. Fostering an ap atmosphere of cultural safety. This one's really important. That's for all patients and populations by practicing open-mindedness and unconditional goodwill. So you really are in service to society. Uh, when you're a doctor. Providing expert and compassionate medical care. Well, let's hope they all do that, right? That's important. And I want to talk a little bit about the curriculum. So it's a four-year program. There are eight modules all told, all together. Years one and two, there are four model, mod, oh my goodness, modules. This is pre-clerkship. You start in the classroom learning the basics, small group sessions, seminars, lectures, and it's a progressive increase in interactive and self-directed learning. And once you've done that, you're going to move to years three and four, which is clerkship. And so here is another four modules. And this is where you're going to translate the knowledge that you got in pre-clerkship and transferred over now to the clinical setting. 
So you'll have simulations, patient assessment, small group sessions. You'll be shadowing other doctors. Uh, there's rotations in each major discipline of medicine and electives. And this is where you do evenings and weekends and on call. This is where it starts. So once you've done the four years, that's actually where you get the degree at the four mark, four year mark. You can't do anything with it. You're not a doctor yet, but you have the degree. Now you've got to go and do residency and specialize in your field. That's going to be two to five years. After that, you're going to write the national exam, either the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada exam or the College of Family Physicians of Canada exam. Now for residency, there are many specialties that you can go into, and not all of them are listed there, but many of them are, and you can look and see if uh, there's anything in there that you're interested in. But the thing is, med students have told us that you may change your mind a couple of times as you're going through, and that's okay, that's okay. Uh, again, there's Canadian Medical Association website, has profiles on most of these specialties, and that link is, is on the page at the front here. So let's talk a little bit about the application requirements. But just before I do this, I, I just want to mention something to all of you because we get a lot of questions about this. We actually do not pre-assess for AGPAs and eligibility to apply. There's just too many applications and we don't have enough time or the resources to do this. So my advice to you is to read the comprehensive information on our website and in the applicant information bulletin, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, apply online, pay your fee, and then we will do the assessment as we're going through and vetting the application. So I just want to let you know that unless there's some major extenuating circumstance as to why we would need to do that. We simply don't. So in order to apply, uh, you need a bachelor's degree. It can be a three or four year degree, and you need to have it by June 30th in the year that you apply. So for example, we're now in the 2017-18 application cycle, and you have to apply by October 1st, but your degree can be finished by June 30th, 2018. You're going to say it's not the application cycle. Yeah, it's the year. I, I don't even want to get into it, but it's, it's, it's the year. You can choose any discipline that you want for this degree. But having said that, in terms of writing the MCAT exam and success in medical school, you do need to consider taking courses in biology and chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, psychology, sociology, biochemistry, research methods. We'll talk about that in a minute. You should choose your courses carefully and always have a plan. Not only for success in medicine, but for, for other careers as well. Medicine's very competitive, and if you don't get in in your first try, then you want to be able to um, work on other things as well, either at work or education or travel if you like, but uh, I think it's really important. The average number of tries to get into medicine is three. So while that's happening, you want to be working on other things as well. Please talk to the academic advisor and your undergraduate degree program to be sure you're meeting all the requirements for your first degree as you work on developing your academic base for application to medicine. That's really important that you make sure you're fulfilling the requirements for that first degree. Okay, so now you've got the degree and now you need the MCAT. This is the Medical College Admissions Test. It's a mandatory standardized multiple choice exam that measures the ability to understand basic concepts and to solve problems in nature, behavioral, and social science. It's administered by the Association of Mer American Medical Colleges. Yes, it's American. Um, and they're called the AAMC. That's the acronym for them. The information's on the page. 
they would also recommend that you consider taking courses in biology, chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, psychology, sociology, and, and so on. And uh, there is a lot of information on their website about this. So in terms of accepted tests for this year, uh, we will accept tests completed no earlier than April 2014. If you apply next year, so for the application deadline next year being October 1st, 2018, we will accept tests completed no earlier than April 2015. So really, this is the last year that you can use uh, an MCAT test prior to MCAT 2015. But I think for most of you, the test you would be looking at is MCAT 2015. Okay, so you need an adjusted grade point average of 3.3. And when we look at this, we're going to include all your undergraduate courses in the calculation. Doesn't matter where you took them or when you took them, whether it was full-time, part-time, within your degree, outside of your degree, at another university. We will look at all of them. We will not look at graduate level courses though. So let's talk about the biochemistry, humanities, social science requirement. Anybody been on the website and know there's been a change to this? A few people are nodding. Okay, so whether these requirements are needed for you depends on the MCAT used for application. So if you're going to use the MCAT written to prior to March 2015, then you do need to meet the biochemistry and humanities social science requirements. However, if you're using the MCAT written after March 2015, so in other words, the MCAT 2015, you do not need to meet the biochemistry and humanities social science requirements. Now some people might have a combination of the older MCAT and the newer one. And so then it really boils down to, well, a lot of things. Which is the better mark for you? Which is the better score? But also which one you decide to do. So for example, MCAT 2015 could be your better score, but then that means you have to, no, I should do it the other way. The one, the one prior to MCAT 2015 could be your, could be your uh, better score, but then you have to have the biochemistry, humanities, and social sciences. So you might decide that you're going to use MCAT 2015 so that you don't need to have the biochemistry and humanities and social science. And that's okay, you need to let us know that and you do need to understand that that may not be your best score, but that's a choice you're making there. We can talk more about that after with those of you who might be where this might apply. But I really want to point out that just because we aren't requiring the biochemistry and humanity and social science in our requirements doesn't mean that you're scot-free and you don't have to take them. You do need these courses to write the MCAT exam. And I would say to be successful in medicine as well. So you need to look at biology and chemistry and organic chemistry and physics. And you need to look at psychology and sociology and biochemistry and research methods. You might not need to take all of them, but some are prerequisites to others. And my advice to you would be to go on the AAMC website on the sheet uh, and take a look at the comp comprehensive information they have there about the MCAT test and about prepping for it. Other eligibility requirements, you need to be a Canadian citizen or permanent resident of Canada. You need proficiency in the English language. There are technical standards requirements. And this is all outlined in our applicant information bulletin and our, there are links there to uh, our policies on, on that. Uh, adult re criminal record check, child abuse registry check, and professional registration. And again, it's all outlined in the applicant information bulletin. So the multiple mini interview, what's that? The MMI. So the MMI is, uh, is basically an interview, but it's uh, 12 stations. 
there's a rest station. So really there's 11 stations you're going to go to. You have 10 minutes at each station, two minutes to read the question at the door, and eight minutes in the room with the interviewer. And you just basically go from room to room. And it's uh, sort of a, you know, if you don't do well at one station, you go to the next station. Well, the interviewer in that room doesn't know that you didn't do well at the one before. So it's like a fresh start each time. The assessment is based on non-academic um, ca uh, characteristics. So education, work, and volunteer experiences, travel experiences, and cultural and world knowledge. These are all things that are going to help you in the MMI. There's information on our website. And I think Career Services also has a workshop on prepping for the MMI. We suggest you study ethics, research ethics, current affairs, and look at the CanMed's physician competency framework, which is on our page there. If you do apply to medicine, practice in a group setting, plan to attend the mock MMI if you do get invited for an interview. There's a lot of information on our website about the MMI. The applicant information bulletin. So this, this, this is it. This is the official policy and procedure document for the Max Rady College of Medicine. And it's really, really important that you read this document. In fact, there's a statement in the online application which reads, I have read and understood the applicant information bulletin. So when you're submitting your application and you go to check off that box, just make sure you're not lying. Just saying. The bulletin is re reviewed annually, and the admissions committee reserves the right to make changes to information uh, that has been passed through Senate. So if you don't get in the first year, um, the new bulletin comes up in August every year, and it's a good idea to read through it. Make sure you are still following uh, the requirements that are listed there. And just keep doing that as you work through the process of applying to medicine. So some people ask me about the applicant statistics. So the statistics, the data that you're looking at here is from class 2021. So this is the class that we just admitted that will be graduating in 2021. So if you were in the Manitoba pool, the AGPA average is 4.26, the old MCAT, the average for that was 10.42, the new MCAT 5, 5.14. So you can just see the numbers there. That will be up on our website, not today, but sometime this month, I hope to have that up. So finding information. So there is our website. Um, again, we have the links on the, on the sheet here. And uh, you can also email us. Um, we're happy to answer emails if you have any, any questions about the program and, and the process. And this is almost the end of my presentation. I just uh, want to leave you with my favorite quote from the most famous doctor that I know. Thank you very much for listening. So I guess we're taking questions, right, Jody? You were going to come up here and help me with that. <laughs> That's definitely. Anybody have any questions? Hi, I have a question about my application. Sure. Uh, I've lived in Canada for the next 10 years, and I have a high school requirement for my English therapy. Do I have to submit my high school chemistry for my English courses, or I'd like to be all by my own to do if you're a U of M student, you've already met the English language proficiency requirement. We don't ask you to meet it again. So once you're a U of M student, that's been met. Okay. So you don't have to submit that again. And I don't have to submit the transcript either. From high school? From university. From university. U of M transcripts are not required, and neither are high school transcripts unless there's a special situation. That we have. All right. Thank you.
And just for everybody raising their eyes about the U of M transcripts are not required, it's, it's not that we don't require them, it's that we, we have them. We can get them, so we don't need you to submit them. It's not that you get a special buy because you're U of M. <laughs> Hi. If somebody's doing their bachelor's by the advanced entry, do they still need to complete three years or you will still consider the bachelor's? Like, because I have a credits from a college, so I'm trying to get as an advanced entry for the bachelor's. So you're asking me about a degree program, and my forte is admissions. So uh, if you're you saying you transferred courses to the U of M from yes, somewhere else? Because uh, one of the requirements is that a person has to have a bachelor's degree of three or four years. Yes. Let's say uh, I have almost three years of college credit. Like I'm a nurse, so you know, okay. college. So if I transfer my credits, and I did my degree in two years, like, like of my enough credits, and do I will be still considered? Right, so you're still gonna get a three or four year degree depending on how many courses science transfers into your science degree, right? So we're only gonna use your university degree level coursework, so we'll evaluate your college coursework to see what's deemed university level. That gets transferred into your degree here and then you complete a three or a four year degree, essentially, even though some of those courses might have been taken somewhere else. Okay, but those grades will be considered. What they I will. Have. Anything that's university degree level, so when you're coming from a college, we have to determine which of those courses are university degree level. They might not all count, but the ones that are deemed university degree level will be used in the AGPA calculation, and will help you with your degree. To okay. Any other questions? Hi. Can you see it again? Yay. Hi. Doesn't the GPA different from the GPA? What's the difference between the GPA and the GPA? So, AGPA is an adjusted grade point average. GPA on your transcript is your is your degree GPA. It's what you received in your degree. But an adjusted GPA, if you look in the bulletin, there's a table depending on how many credit hours you've completed. We drop a certain amount of courses. So essentially, once you have four years, we drop a maximum of 30 credit hours, and then your GPA is adjusted using only the uh, less 30 credit hours. Okay. I told you that Jody. <laughs> Any other questions? It's the, your lowest credit hours, no matter where they fall. Um, if you are using the old um, MCAT, then we will not drop biochemistry. But now, with the uh, with the new MCAT and not using biochemistry, it can be dropped if it's one of your lowest courses that it's not required. I'm just going to pick you and then the gentleman right over there. Hi. What's the most common thing that you find lacking in most applicants to med school? Their applications and their seriously <laughs> that you don't read the applicant information bulletin. <laughs> Um, I was I, going to say besides that. Besides <laughs> that. The thing that's lacking. You well, mean I don't what area do you see the most the struggle in, like yeah. as far as their scores? Yes. Well, the MMI is weighted very heavy, so um, that's probably um, one of the strongest components. Yeah, that's one of the strongest components. There's, there's the aspect, aspect of getting the interview first, and so then the MCAT's weighted at 72.7% of the composite score. So that sometimes is a struggle for people to get their score high enough to be competitive because there are so many applications. Once you get an interview, then the MMI uh, becomes a component in that. Then the MCAT sco score, the weight on it drops to 40% of the composite score and the MMI uh, then is 45% of that score. The MCAT and, and the MMI scores are really um, big components of the composite score. Does that sort of answer your question? Hi, I think you had a question. I was wondering what would save you from a low GPA, like not you can still get in, but would an MMI, a high grade, or a MCAT bring uh, Okay, you so if your AGPA is lower, um, then you're going to have to do really well on that on the MCAT to to get um, an interview. So if you're looking here, so these are the these 
these numbers here are the uh, scores at the time um, of admission, but you can see if you're in the Manitoba pool and your average uh, on the new MCAT is 514, if you are sitting with an AGPA around 3.9 or so, then, then your MCAT is going to have to be better than that. So if you are struggling with that, trying to figure all that out, that's where you should come and see us. And we can go through and, and look at the different options for you. Okay. Anybody else? Hi. Uh, if you apply after second year, I guess you don't have enough credits for the AGPA. Is that correct? Yeah, so when we select for the interview, we're going to use the grades that are available at the time of application. So if you're doing a three-year degree, you won't have enough to drop any courses. Um, then we do a final, if you do get an interview, we do a final ranking and we use the final GPA, AGPA, and that's when we'll be able to drop your, your lowest 15 credit hours. Okay. Any other questions? Nope. Yeah. Uh, I know it's a very awkward question. Being in a nursing career, does it help in a medicine? So in terms of getting in, you mean? Not getting in, like, does it help when you're preparing for your application? And Because I was talking to, like, in the health science center, one of the residents, to, and he told me that when they interview you, when they select your application, it really depends, like, how wide the experience and how, what's the diversity you have. Like, let's say if somebody's near 28 and 29 and they have like a lot of experience of all these careers that they might consider this thing. Is it no. true? Sorry. I just, I just thought that's such a misconception. You, everything we do here is based on the numbers and I'm sorry to tell you it is a brutal process. We're going to take the numbers, we're going to rank you and we're going to cut it off at that point. And I actually, when we're doing this process, I take the names out of it completely. Names, gender, birth date, I take that out completely. So all I'm looking at is the student number and the scores that you have. So where you might be able to showcase your experience would be in the MMI, actually in the interview. And, and if that experience comes and you do well in the interview and you're able to answer the questions and you really showcase yourself, that's where it would be of a benefit to you. But it's not considered. I don't look at it and go, you have 15 years of this, and you over here have nothing. Therefore, I'm going to take you. Don't do that. That, that would be a very subjective thing. It wouldn't be fair to anybody, even to you, actually. Yeah. I, there was a question I'm, here, and then I'll, then I'll come back to you. I'm just wondering, who's interviewing you in MMIs? So we have uh, people from all over the community. We have rural interviewers. We have some that are, that are students. We have uh, clinicians, physicians, some uh, standardized patients. We try to have a, a balance of, of many different people that, that you would meet coming through your track. Uh, just, I think this gentleman, you had still had a question? Um, so and then I'll come to you. Sorry. Invited, so it's basically based on your numbers, basically. Just yep. Score, your weight, and yep. Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think this gentleman was first. Now I'll come back to you. Yeah. If you don't have any more J or extension, well, again, it doesn't. It's not weighted in in our um, consideration of you. And that, that might be different from other universities, but for us, I mean, the, the research has shown that these kind of things, this is the non-cognitive aspect of the application, really has no effect on the type of student we take in or the type of student that we graduate at the end. And so we, we don't look at that. Again, where you can showcase that is in the interview. Um, Well, it's as standardized as we can get it. I'll be right with you. Uh, it's as standardized as we can get it. We have the interviewers come in. They all go through a training session. Uh, there's three tracks that we run. Um, so you could be on any one of those tracks, but the interviewers in those tracks. So for example, station one, the interviewers across station one will get together and talk about 
um, the whatever the question is that that they're going to be marking and what's important to them so that across the three tracks we get uh, a similar marking. I don't know if that really answers your question. But, uh, yeah, but they're all, we have training session and parameters and things for them that they need to look at. There were some questions in the back. Yeah, hi. Um, some people say that nowadays they're looking for more well-rounded students. Like they'll accept, um, like you do a Bachelor of Science but then major in like English or something. Does that give you like a higher chance? No? No. No. So that doesn't matter at all? No, it doesn't. I mean, you know, overall we, we would like diversity in our doctors, so I like to see more than just science apply. But, but really when it, when it comes down to it and we're vetting the applications and ranking, that's not what we're looking at. Was, yeah, hi. Sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, if you if you need to go, that that's fine. Yeah, thank you for coming. Anybody else here? Sorry. Okay, I'm just going to take someone who hasn't asked a question yet. Hi. Uh, so there is no reference component to. No. Yes, we do ask for references. So if you if you are invited for an interview, we will ask you at that point to submit the references. Where the references come into the whole application process, they're not part of the ranking, but we do look at them to see, you know, what kind of what kind of person you are and to see if there's any issues in there. So if you have someone who says to me, she was late for everything, she rolled her eyes every time I asked her to do something, um, that might be something where I would send your application to the professionalism committee first before before we went further. I lost track of who I was. You had a question and you, you have one, right? Right, you, in the pink shirt, right there. You, oh, no, you didn't? Oh, okay. that was Yeah, me. hi. What's the basic component of these interviews? Like, what they usually looking for in the interviews? So I just went over some of the things with the, with the MMI there. So you want to be looking at the, the competencies that we discussed. You want to be looking at ethics. Um, Current affairs, things like that. So basically, it's the work ethic is nothing like with the related to the schooling, like with the school of science or whatever the bachelor's you done is not, not related to it. It's basically your work ethics and what kind of a person you are, right? So it's research more, uh, about the interview. Yeah. So it's based on things like research ethics. It's based on the CanMed's um, competency framework, which was which I talked to you about the things that are important to being a good doctor. Um, so if you read up on those things and you look about and you read on research ethics, there's tons of books out there on how to prep for the MMI. Those are those are the kind of things that you want to be focused on. And get yourself in a group that's practicing. That's really important. I uh, one question came to my mind. Is MD patient program or like there's more competition for undergrad students like that for the MD-PhD program? So the MD-PhD program within medicine, you mean? Yeah, so that, that is a, that's an option or a stream that, that you could go into if you wanted. Uh, and so for the purposes of this group here, if you're interested in that, could you come down and see me afterwards and we can talk more in depth about that. Hi. You're talking about the composition of the score to get like to get put to forward to the interview portion. How did how is that broken down? Like you said, the MCAT was worth seventy. What what are the other components of how how they're weighted? So the AGPA for the first time round for ranking. Oh, you really going to push my brain here. For the first time round for ranking to get an interview, the AGPA is 27, 23.7 percent of the score. I think. Uh, so if you hang on with me, I'll give you the actual numbers. The, uh, the MCAT is 72.7% of that score. And then there's some um, coefficients, diversity coefficients and, and advanced academic attributes that where you could get a slight coefficient. It's, it's not enough it, it's to very, change it. It's very little. Yeah, it's really a nod towards diversity in in the applicants, so just hang on, I'll give you the exact numbers. You could, of course, read the applicant information bulletin, it's all in there, but um, 
pay. So first time around, 27.3% AGPA, 72.7% your MCAT, and then the rural coefficient, academic coefficient, socioeconomic coefficients are on, are on there as well. Okay, and then once you, um, once you have had the MMI score and we're ranking now for offers for admission, then your AGPA is worth 15%. 40% is the MCAT, 45% is the MMI, and then you still got the coefficients on there as well. Okay? Yeah. Hi. I heard that um, in first years, your GPA, like a rising GPA, can make a difference. Can it? How do you mean? In like your. A rising GPA over your academic year. A can, rising. Like, even if you started low. Your GPA is Are you talking course, about sir. within your first degree, your undergraduate yes. degree? Well, we're going to look at all the courses. The maximum we could take out would be 30 credit hours if you had the equivalent of 120 credit hours. But that could happen anywhere within that degree. We're going to take the worst, in that case, 120 credit hours. We'll take the worst 30 out, but they may not all be in that first year. So I'm not sure if a rising AGPA through first, second, and third year will necessarily make a difference like that. Do you have something to yeah, add to I'm that? I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question, but is it because you think as if you improve more in your last year, you're weighted better? Is that what you Yes. Mean? Okay, so it's just the AGPA is a number. So if you did really bad in your first in your first year and it gets dropped because it's one of 30 credit hours, your AGPA is your number. If you do bad in your last year and that's the 30 credit hours that dropped, the AGPA is your number. The committee's not going to look at when those grades went up or down. Is that answer? Yes. Which is different from a, yeah. a program that might look at your last 60 credit hours, in which case then maybe as you went through, if your last two years, your last 60 credit hours were better than in a program like that, that might be more advantageous for you. But that's not what we do with this one. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, well, I want to thank you for coming out and for listening to me and asking all your questions. Uh, if we're, both Jody and Stephanie and I will be here at the front if you, and I guess Kathy and, as well, if you, if you have any more.